Elizabeth Farm is a place of stories. Stories spanning 200 years. Stories about Elizabeth and John MacArthur, who built the cottage in 1793. About early colonial life in Australia. About the Victorian era and about changed attitudes to conservation. Today, the conserved cottage offers the visitor an open access that has not been possible in other historical homes. MacArthur and his wife Elizabeth, both in their early 20s, arrived in Australia in 1790. In February 1793, John MacArthur, an ambitious officer in the new colony, was granted, through his officer connections, some of the best land that has been discovered. On this land, I have built a most excellent brick house. A simple rectangular cottage resembling a typical rural English farmhouse. It had four box-like rooms with a steeply pitched shingle roof and was whitewashed with small sashed windows on either side of the door. As with most of the early colonial architecture, it made few concessions to the Australian climate. Every plank of wood used in the house was painstakingly hand-cut from local ironbark, or ironwood, as the convicts called it. Large nails or bolts were so scarce in the new colony that timber pegs were used to join all the major timber trusses. The bricks were made from clay obtained locally and hand-pressed without the benefit of a kiln. Elizabeth Farm, which was both a family home and a farm, was the site for the first experiments in merino wool production in Australia. It is thought that MacArthur added extra rooms around 1806 to accommodate his growing family. He added verandas to the north and east, one of his first adjustments to suit the Australian climate. As MacArthur devoted his energies to developing his estate in Camden, Neglect at Elizabeth Farm caused Elizabeth to write in 1822, Our poor Parramatta house is tumbling down. It is quite a ruin. Four years after Elizabeth's complaint, John set about with manic enthusiasm, extending and improving the cottage to make it more suited to his wealth and prominence in the colony. He altered the entire profile of the house by building a new roof which enclosed the early lean-to verandas and gave it a new Regency dress. He wrote to his son, I wish you could see me writing this, seated in the old bedroom, now transformed into a handsome library. The addition has been obtained by taking in the veranda. A foot has also been gained by lowering the floors. We are occupying the old drawing room as a dining room adjoining to which is a pretty conservatory or plants room. All the family are pleased and satisfied with the altered house, and strangers speak of it with great praise. In 1827, his son James offered this description of the house. The roof alone remains. The cottage which it formerly sheltered, having been transformed by our father's fertile genius into an elegant, commodious residence. As MacArthur alternated between periods of frenzied building and bouts of depression, Elizabeth had cause to write in 1832. It is the old story, setting a variety of wheels in motion with a steam engine power, planning, building, changing his mind continually, and in short, keeping his family in a perpetual worry. MacArthur's erratic behavior led him to have this fireplace installed in three separate rooms before it came to rest in a chimney place for which it was too large. 
By 1832, MacArthur was pronounced insane and remained locked in his bedroom library for over a year. On his death in 1834, the rebuilding of Elizabeth Farm remained incomplete. Elizabeth commissioned architect John Verge to complete the building works. Elizabeth died in 1850, having lived most of her life in... That home endeared to me by its having been my abode for so many years, and in a variety of circumstances, some indeed of a very painful nature, and others of serene happiness. From 1854, Elizabeth Farm was in the hands of agents acting on behalf of the family, and was neglected. During the 1860s, the timber Doric columns and delicate treliage to the verandas were replaced with cast iron columns, but the place became seriously dilapidated. MacArthur's distinctive French door at the front entrance was replaced by this Victorian door. During the 1880s, a galvanized iron roof put over the leaking wooden shingles inadvertently preserved the original roof. The estate was subdivided and sold by the MacArthurs, then leased to a number of tenants. William Swan purchased the property in 1904 for the price of the land only as the house was considered too old and dilapidated to be an asset. The Swans recognized the historic value of the house and must be given credit for saving Elizabeth Farm. The Swan family cherished the house and during their very long occupancy, they changed little. When maintenance became too difficult for the elderly Swan sisters, the house was sold to the Elizabeth Farm Museum Trust in 1968. The house, which had been proclaimed an historic building under the County of Cumberland planning scheme, was ensured protection. In 1977, the state government acquired the property. Elizabeth Farm was considered to be of such significance that it was the first property to be protected by a permanent conservation order. In 1978, the Heritage Council of New South Wales and the Public Works Department began assessment on how best to conserve Elizabeth Farm. To determine its cultural significance, research into the history of the buildings and its occupants began and from this information, a conservation program was developed. It was decided that as much as possible of the original material of the house should be preserved. The emphasis was on repairing and conserving, rather than replacing. The many alterations and additions to the buildings, including those of the Victorian period, were accepted as part of the interesting history of the farm. The front door, the iron columns and the roof, all from the Victorian period, were retained. One of the major structural problems facing conservationists was the extensive cracking to the walls caused by the unstable clay foundations. Many sections of the building had to be underpinned and damaged brickwork carefully repaired. A major chimney, which had developed a dangerous lean, was taken apart and then rebuilt with the original bricks. Two centuries of termite attack to the timbers, together with the wish to preserve as much of the original beams as possible, led to this innovative method of injecting epoxy resin under pressure. This process has preserved many of the original beams and timbers in the roof and reinforced their strength. Where the timber was too damaged for this, new timber was placed alongside the old, retaining as much of the original as possible. 
This room, formed in the 1826 remodeling, has been left unrestored in order to demonstrate the original construction techniques. The plaster on the ceilings and walls, amongst the oldest of their type in Australia, had pulled apart from the timber over the years. During renovation, as much as possible of the original wall plaster was retained. Skilled craftsmen applied the traditional 200-year-old techniques of plastering with a mix of rock lime, sand and chopped cow hair. Replicas were made of the original plaster mouldings using the same specialized techniques and materials that MacArthur's tradesmen used in 1826. Much care and thought has gone into the exquisite cedar joinery work. Sections of badly damaged or termited cedar were carefully cut out and repaired or replaced. The patina of age, the build-up of polish in grooves and cracks, was carefully preserved. Color schemes dating from the 1820s to the 1850s were used. Just one example of the detective work involved in matching physical and documentary evidence can be found in the paint scheme for Elizabeth MacArthur's bedroom. A tradesman's bill recorded that when the room was redecorated in 1845, the room was painted with peach blossom distemper. A few dribbles of the original paint were found behind the skirting board where they had remained unaffected by the light. And so it is this color which has been used in its restoration. Much of Elizabeth MacArthur's joy in the farm came in tending the gardens. The restored garden has been based on pictorial and written documentation. This olive tree is thought to have been planted by John MacArthur and is among the oldest surviving exotic trees in Australia. The hoop pines were planted in the early 1800s and still survive. Research into the original furnishings revealed a very large collection of objects that had belonged to the MacArthur's. It was decided to make modern replicas of these objects as part of the hands-on approach to the museum. Other furnishings have been reduced to their simplest forms or shapes by using cloths and loose covers. This 1865 sketch of the drawing room by the MacArthur's granddaughter Elizabeth served as the basis of the present furnishing. This deliberately sparse furnishing of the house is like that of a theatre set, intended to suggest how the rooms were used and to create a mood. The museum has been designed to recreate the character, feel and smell of the original home. For a visitor, the guides tie together the many stories of the house. Elizabeth Farm not only encapsulates the early social and architectural history of the colony, it is also a statement of Australia's changing attitude to conservation. The successful restoration of this unique house has been the result of a six-year conservation program initiated and funded by the Heritage Council of New South Wales and undertaken by the Government Architects Branch of the Public Works Department. The site was handed to the Historic Houses Trust of New South Wales which prepared the interpretive displays and is responsible for its management. The original home of John and Elizabeth MacArthur, two centuries later, has entered a new phase of its history.